can I have an H, please? Yeah, immediately. I need it um, for a talk with my community. They're, they're waiting, so. Okay, thanks. Hello, beautiful community. We're going to talk about where the Russian people are at in 2023 in a slightly unusual way, both more casually and more dialogically, because we're going to come at it via a question that I think the insiders, the biggest insiders in our community are going to find a little strange because it's quite at odds with sorts of things that most experts tend to say about Russian, uh, the state of Russian opinion. Um, and often, of course, that's a negative state. In other words, there's not a public opinion at all in Russia in many respects. But we'll give this a go. Brief announcement. Um, we, Anna and I, Anna from Ukraine and I, had a chat about questions that are up in the air at the moment and and has shared that in two installments yesterday and today on her channel go and have a look the last installment i'm struggling quite a bit with brain problems so i'm very slow and words are slow to come out it used to hurt me a lot when i first came back to functioning after being too ill to speak that doesn't hurt me at all but it means that it's slow for you as, as you watch and listen, but the points are really important. I really stick by them. Now, before we get to Edmund, hi Edmund, I, I'm going to be critical but not mean, I hope, about your question. Um, but it's obviously us honoring you by your question taking up the whole episode. Um, and I think that's going to be helpful to everybody. So there we go. But first, a few things about Russian society that we could put in a slightly different way to the way our normal conversations go. Number one, of course, there is a lot of fear about. And when fear is ubiquitous, you stop not just saying things you're not allowed to say, but you stop thinking things you're not allowed to say. And that's a dangerous and worrying trend, particularly for people who are on that bubble or in between being in a depoliticized blob and being anti-war. I think the rigorously anti-war people are going to remain stable. They're just in a lot of trouble, but they're trying to keep their stuff together. But those who are on the bubble between the two are at risk of no longer thinking things because they've, they've become things that can't be said. Of course, there is an extraordinary kind of conformism that we have too, but it's deeper there. There is consumerism, that is something that we can most closely relate to perhaps. We do have a problem with relating to politics, like consumers consuming consumer goods. And Therefore, it's not an alien picture that when the war starts and IKEA is about to close, the Russians run there. And then there is something that is much more special than any of the other three to Russia. Well, of course, fear is special too. It's special to repressive societies. But the other thing that's really special is a, an extraordinary kind of fatalism. And perhaps we'll say a little bit more about it. Uh, Edmund's question. Don't freak out about it, because Edmund's saying very different things to the sorts of things I recommend we think about where the Russian population is at. Because here, the question of love arises again, right? Because when I talk about love, I'm not talking about kumbaya between you and me. I'm talking about a situation that if you come for lunch, dressed up, sort of normal, will discuss and have lunch but if you come in a giant chicken suit for lunch a giant giraffe suit you'll be just as welcome now i won't withhold from point now you're wearing a giraffe suit but we will have lunch we will discuss that's love i mean in the sense of love in the in the relationship between um somebody who is producing public intellectual content and somebody who is, let's not use the word, let's not use the word, consuming it. Um, Edmund, 
don't feel I'm beating you up. But you're quite a bit off here, and we're just going to have to walk through that. The Russian nation, this is Edmund, has been overcome by a dreadful nihilism, and so Edmund's been following the channel for a long time and is a supporter of the channel on Patreon, um, which is a place where people who are committed to this conversation growing and in a position to um, support that on where they join. Um, I don't share anything special there. It's just a way of... Um, investing in the idea, particularly under my health limitations of this conversation, growing and having a bigger impact in the world, becoming increasingly sustainable. The Russian nation has become overcome by dreadful nihilism, where the value of human life is seen as slightly negative, and the taking of a human life is seen as a positive good. Now, Edmund, that is not quite, well, it's not even remotely true. We will come back to that. And you say there are three examples you can think of. The first is Butcher. And what you say here, basically, is that because, according to Russian propaganda, Ukrainians are Russians who are suffering from false consciousness, Butcher is a case of Russians killing Russians and thinking that that's good, and therefore you're saying that Russians see killing Russians as a positive good. Well, even if that were true, that would be a misdescription because humans act on destructive capabilities. In other words... Um, much of the worst stuff humans do, they don't do because they are trying to be good but um, are very bad at being good. That that's, It's them being good going very badly. No, it's them being destructive, it's them being bad. Um, so let's not forget about negative values, right? Um, and negative capabilities. But, of course, it's not the case that that's seen as something good by um, the majority of Russians. Um, in fact, the majority of Russians are positively trying to evade politics altogether. So they, don't have, they don't have a political view. But before saying anything more in any of these directions, let's simply point out that what you've done here is a kind of bit of deduction that is just too rapid as a way of trying to understand another country. Right? So Russian propaganda says Ukrainians are Russians, Ukrainians are killing, Russians are killing Ukrainians, which for them means, means they're killing Russians, which means they must think it's a good thing to kill Russians, and that must make them absolute monsters, because that doesn't make any sense. Now, you've, you've, oh, you've extracted a human culture more or less from the circle of intelligibility so rapidly that something must have gone very wrong with your thinking here. So what is it? Well, that level of rapidity is just never going to work. According to that level of rapidity, we could also just say, well, let's take the United States. Is it a democracy? Well, kind of seems to be. So therefore, American citizens kind of want their governments to do what they're doing. How do we explain the Iraq war? not just the um, human costs of it, but how transparent it was that the whole enterprise was based on dreadful, misguided assumptions. So that surely must mean that if that's done by government represents most Americans because it's democracy, that must mean that the whole country is either a bunch of evildoers or a bunch of deliberative disasters who can't think properly, or both. But you see, that's too rapid. <laughs> that, that's, that's not in any way an adequate political, sociological, cultural, psychological explanation. It's just a piece of deduction. And it's too quick. It doesn't work like that, you know. If a swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, is being built over there, and you want to find out if it's, if it's nice and if it's good for the community, you need more than just a couple of words you've heard about it here and there on the street to make the evaluation. So you've been too rapid. Then you're saying Russian conscripts are behaving very strangely. It's your second example. And again, you bring this business of them perhaps thinking that killing Russians must be a good thing because that's what they're doing on their terms. And you say that What's so strange is that you can't imagine any other conscripts of any other country doing this. So that must 
make the Russian conscripts very strange, and indeed thus make them rather unintelligible to us. Um, well, first of all, yes, the idea that Ukrainians are Russians suffering from false consciousness who are being manipulated by the US empire has currency, and thus swim about, but it has its limitations too. So in many respects, Russian soldiers believe they're fighting Ukrainians and that Ukrainians are a real thing. Um, and there's plenty of double-mindedness that we can discuss there, but we, we, we won't delve too deeply into it. Um, when you talk about um, the Russians must think that it's good to kill Russians, um, again, in the case of the Russian soldiers, I'm just going to leave that behind because I think what the couple of words we've said about it already suffices. But what I'll speak to is this business of how Russian soldiers agree to this. I'll just say one thing about it. It's an expression of fatalism for some folks who end up in the Russian army. It goes something like this. Well, if they take me, I'm going to, I suppose, go. It's kind of bad here. Might be worse there, but I'm gonna. If they, then I will. Because if they, and then if, they, if, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll just, you know, if it hap if it happens, if it happens. But then once it begins to happen, it becomes harder to not buy into the idea that there must be some really good reason for it. Why? Because it's not possible that you, or perhaps people in your family, are getting killed and are killing for absolutely no reason at all. That becomes, the, the more you get involved, the more unbelievable the story that the Russian uh, project, the Kremlin project, Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, has nothing to offer anybody at all. This is just a zilch. This is just a bringing death and destruction and violence, and that's it. It becomes harder to believe the more you get involved, you know. Um, and there is a history there, too. If you look at the victims, at the greatest victims of the crimes of 20th century Soviet repression, for example, often it's precisely the fact that you were a victim in a dreadful way that made it harder for you to see an evil for the evil that it is, right? Um, not long before he died, the Russian filmmaker, Mr. Govoruchin, he died a couple of years ago, um, was talking in public about his um, relationship, I think, with his grandfather, who was repressed by Stalin. At that point, Govoruchin ended up got his knickers in a knot because he was defending a statue of Stalin that was being put up in Moscow, a bust of Stalin put up in Moscow in 2017 together with a bunch of other busts I think around 2017 and um, Kovarukhin was going around saying well the very fact that my grandfather was repressed suggests that maybe there was something to it, maybe he did get up to some Thing wrong but maybe he didn't but the fact that this happened to him suggests that it, there may have been something there right? that's a pattern that's real then you apply the same stuff to uh, nuclear threat and you say well Russians think that you know um, nuclear devastation is a good thing and again I won't I won't reventilate the idea that that's not the case, that the Russians don't think that destruction of the whole world is a good thing, destruction of, U of Ukrainians is a good thing, that is not what most of the Russian population thinks. But is there again just a little bit of something wrong in that direction? Well, of course, we made a video about that on the main channel. And the realm in which it's really wrong and off is in that pro- pro-war and pro-victory hardline realm. And there, 
there is a tendency to talk about a nuclear strike without the word nuclear. Um, and the expression goes, delivering a strike. And there are people going around sort of desensitizing themselves to the ghastliness of nuclear war disgracefully by saying, in answer to the question, what's your policy toward the United States? The delivery of a strike is their answer. And the implications is a nuclear strike. Um, but you know, again, we're talking about very disturbing slippages among a small minority of the population. The majority of Russians are still desperately trying to stay away from politics. And that creates a problem that is not just um, practical, but constitutive in answering the question, what do Russians think? Because um, to answer that question, you need to have a society where there is such a thing as a, a public position that people have. Um, and so there is a kind of a constitutive thing with thinking that Russia, the Russian population as a whole has views about the Ukraine war. If you went to January 2022 and you um, talked to a lot of Russians of all kinds about the possibility of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the premise that Putin wasn't going to do it, the number of people who had been favored would be tiny. Right? So it's a story of outsourcing politics to people who are going to work it out for you and the tragedy of how badly that kind of story ends when it gets organically elaborated as it was organically elaborated in the 90s and then it was systematically and intentionally elaborated this business of citizens outsourcing politics to the Kremlin in the noughties and in the 2010s by the Putin regime. So it was a project to depoliticize the population by then, whereas in the 1990s it was less a project and more, more of a political, just a political pathology. You say it's not just the people in power, Edmund, it's the whole nation. Well, it isn't. And, and how can the world be protected from Russia if Russia sees death as a good thing? Um, and how can the Russian people be healed? Now, again, there is, of course, a problem with a certain kind of cult of death and a certain kind of destructiveness for destructiveness sake and a certain kind of, well, if we can't have the kind of world we want, then Bachum, bachum, and bachum will just wreck stuff. But that's um, uh, an item that swims about in, in, in the culture, infecting quite a lot around it. Um, but most Russians are still mostly not very deeply infected by that. Right? There is a small number who are very deeply infected by that indeed, but it just doesn't cover the rest of the population. And it would terrify the regime indeed if it did cover most of the population because it would mean a kind of politicization of the population that for now Putin thinks he isn't ready for. What else is there about healing? Well, healing comes from the understanding that there is an alternative and that you can act toward it. In our culture, in the West, we are terrible at normative thought about our politics. Our normative thought about our politics, because of how polarized we are, because of how little trust we have, it's worse in the United States than it is in other countries. But our thoughts, normative thought about politics is really like shards of glass that should be part of a, a whole bottle with integrity, but can't be because the bottle has fallen apart. But 
on the whole, Russian citizens are altogether stuck and for now incapable of normative thought about their politics. And their normative thought isn't screwed up like ours. It's simply not there. They're unable to reflect on what might be an alternative to the politics that we have and what steps might be taken toward that. And that's the job not just of the Russian opposition, but it's also um, our job indeed, insofar as we want what happens in the Russian space to be, um, well, perhaps better for the people who are on it, but also to be um, more sustainable and positive for all of us, not just for Ukraine, but for all of us, whose security and safety depends on, you know, it not being a case of all hell breaking loose on that territory, because that doesn't leave the world a safe place. That will do, Edmund. Don't I hope you don't cry. And beautiful community, thank you for bearing with me, and we'll talk very soon.